Chapter Six, Part Two of American Men of Action by Burton Egbert Stevenson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. Pioneers, Part Two. Boone and Kenton, with a handful of hardy and fearless pioneers, laid the foundations of Kentucky. But in the history of the old Northwest, the country north of the Ohio and east of the Mississippi, one name stands out transcendent. The name of a man as daring, as brave, as resourceful as any on the border, George Rogers Clark. He was greater than Boone or Kenton in that he had a wider vision. They saw only the duties of the present. He saw the possibilities of the future. And his exploits form one of the most thrilling chapters of American history. Clark, a Virginian by birth, started out in life as a surveyor, and early in 1775 we moved to Kentucky to follow his profession. There was no doubt plenty of surveying to be done there, since the whole country was an uncharted wilderness. But the beginning of the revolution was accompanied by an immediate outbreak of Indian hostilities, so serious that the very existence of the Kentucky settlements was threatened. Soon, all but two of them, Boonesboro and Harrodsburg, had to be abandoned. Boone was, of course, in command at his fort, and Clark, who had seen some service in Dunmore's war, became the natural leader at Harrods. His influence rapidly increased, and he was chosen as a delegate to journey to Williamsburg and urge upon Virginia the need of the western colony, which lay within her chartered limits. Clark set off without delay on the long and dangerous journey reached Williamsburg, gained an audience of Patrick Henry, the governor of Virginia, and painted the needs of Kentucky in such colors that he soon gained the sympathy of the impulsive and warm-hearted governor, and together they secured from the assembly a large gift of lead and powder for the protection of the frontier. More than that, they succeeded in making Virginia acknowledge her responsibility for the new colony by constituting it the county of Kentucky. This, it may be added, put an end forever to Henderson's dream of the independent colony of Transylvania. Clark got his powder and ball safe to Harrodsburg, just in time to repel a desperate Indian assault. But it was evident that there would be no safety for the Kentucky settlements, so long as England controlled the country north of the Ohio. All that region formed a part of what was known as the province of Quebec. Here and there, dotted through it, were quaint little towns of French Creoles, the most important being Detroit, Vincennes on the Wabash, and Kaskaskia and Cahokia on the Illinois. These French villages were ruled by British officers commanding small bodies of regular soldiers, and keeping the Indians in a constant state of war against their Kentucky neighbors, furnishing them with arms and ammunition, and rewarding them for every expedition they undertook against the Americans. They had no idea that any band of Americans which could be mustered west of the mountains would dare to attack them, and so were careless in their guard and maintained only small garrisons at the various forts. All this Clark found out by means of spies, which he sent through the country, and finally, having his plan matured, he went again to Virginia in December 1777, and laid before Governor Henry his whole idea, explaining in detail why he thought it could be carried out successfully. Henry was at once enthused with it. So daring and full of promise, he thought it, and he enlisted the aid of Thomas Jefferson. The result was that when Clark set out on his return journey, it was with orders not only to defend Kentucky, but to attack Kaskaskia and the other British posts, and he carried with him 1,200 pounds in paper money, and an order on the commander of Fort Pitt for such boats and ammunition as he might need. With great difficulty, Clark got together a force of about a hundred and fifty men, one of whom was Simon Kenton. He could not get many volunteers from Kentucky, because the settlers there thought they had all they could do to defend their own forts without going out to attack the enemies, and only a few men could be spared. In May 1778, this little force started down the Ohio in flatboats, and landing just before they reached the Mississippi, marched northward against Kaskaskia, where the British commander of the entire district had his headquarters. Clark knew that his force was outnumbered by the garrison, and that it would be necessary to surprise the town. After a six days' march across country, he came to the outskirts of the village on the evening of July 4th, and found a great dance in progress in the fort. Waiting until the revelry was at its height, Clark advanced silently, surprised the sentries, and surrounded the fort without causing any alarm. 
Then, with his men posted, Clark walked forward through the open door and, leaning against the wall, watched the dancers as they whirled around by the light of the flaring torches. Suddenly, an Indian, after looking at him for a moment, raised the war whoop. The dancing ceased, but Clark, shouting at the top of his voice to still the confusion, bade the dancers continue asking them only to remember that thereafter they were dancing under the flag of the United States instead of that of Great Britain. A few moments later, the commandant was captured in his bed, and the investment was complete. The other settlements in the neighborhood surrendered at once, so that the Illinois country was captured without the firing of a gun. But when the news reached the British governor, Hamilton, at Detroit, he at once prepared to recapture the country. He had a much larger force at his command than Clark could possibly muster, and in the fall of the year he advanced against Vincennes at the head of over 500 men. The little American garrison was unable to oppose such a force and was compelled to surrender. Instead of pushing on against Clark at Kaskaskia, Hamilton disbanded his Indians and sent some of his troops back to Detroit, and prepared to spend the winter at Vincennes. He repaired the fort, strengthened the defenses, and then sat down for the winter, confident that when spring came he would again be master of the whole Illinois country. Clark at Kaskaskia realized that it was a question of his taking the British or the British taking him, and that if he waited for spring he would have no chance at all. So he gathered together the pick of his men, 170 all told, and early in February 1779 set out for Vincennes. The task before him was to capture a force nearly equal to his own, protected by a strong fort well supplied for a siege. At first, the journey was easy enough, for they passed across the snowy Illinois prairies, broken occasionally by great stretches of woodland. But when they reached the drowned lands of the Wabash, the march became almost incredibly difficult. The ice had just broken up, and everything was flooded. Heavy rain set in and when the men were not wading through icy water, they were struggling through mud nearly knee-deep. After twelve days of this, they came to the bank of the Embarrass River, only to find the country all under water, save one little hillock, where they spent the night without food or fire. For four days they waited there for the flood to retire, with practically nothing to eat, but the rain continued, and the flood increased, and Clark, finally, in desperation, plunged into the water and called to his men to follow. All day they waited, and toward evening reached a small patch of dry ground where they spent a miserable night. At sunrise, Clark started on again, through icy water waist-deep, this time with a stern command to shoot the first laggard. Some of the men failed and sank beneath the waves, to be rescued by the stronger ones, and by the middle of the afternoon they had all got safe to land. By good fortune, they captured some Indian squaws with a canoe load of food, and had their first meal in two days. Soon afterwards the sun came out, and they saw before them the walls of the fort they had come to capture. The British had no suspicion of their danger, and they thought the first patter of bullets against the palisades the usual friendly salute from an Indian hunting party. But they were soon undeceived, and answered the rifles with ineffective fire from their two small cannon. All night the fight continued, and at dawn an Indian war party, which had been ravaging the Kentucky settlements, entered the town, ignorant that the Americans had captured it. Marching up to the fort, they suddenly found themselves surrounded and seized. In their belts they carried the scalps of the settlers, men, women, and children. They had slain, and infuriated at the sight, the Americans tomahawked the savages, one after another, before the eyes of the British. Then Clark sent to the fort a peremptory summons to surrender, adding that his men were eager to avenge the murder of their relatives and friends, and would welcome an excuse to storm the fort. To the British it seemed a choice between surrender and massacre. They had seen the bloody vengeance wreaked upon their Indian allies, and they had every reason to believe that they would be dealt with in the same manner, since it was they who had set the Indians on. Clark was himself, of course, in desperate straits without means for carrying on a successful siege but the british were far from suspecting this and at ten o'clock on the morning of february twenty fifth seventeen seventy nine marched out and stacked arms while clark fired a salute of thirteen guns in honor of the colonies from those possessions the northwest was never again to pass for eight years longer clark devoted his life to protecting the border from british and indian invasion <laughs> 
The war over, he returned to Kentucky and took up his abode in a little log cabin on the Ohio near Louisville. He was without means, and a horrible accident marred his last years, for while alone in his cabin he was stricken with paralysis and fell with one of his legs in the old-fashioned fireplace. There was no one to draw him out of danger, and before the pain brought him partially to his senses, his leg was so badly burned that it had to be amputated. There were no anesthetics in those days, but while the leg was being removed, a fife and drum corps played its hardest at the bedside, and the dowdy old warrior kept time to the music with his fingers. He lived for ten years thereafter, though his paralysis never left him. He felt keenly the ingratitude of the Republic which he had served so well, and which yet, in his old age, abandoned him to want and the story is told that when the state of virginia sent him a sword of honor he thrust it into the ground and broke it with his crutch i gave virginia a sword when she needed one he said but now when i need bread she sends me a toy in the settlement of the country north of the ohio one man a veteran of the revolution was foremost his name was rufus putnam and he was a cousin of that israel putnam some of whose exploits we will soon relate. He has been well called the Father of Ohio, for he was the founder of the first permanent white settlement made within the borders of the state. He was born in 1738 at Sutton, Massachusetts, and his early life was a hard and rough one. Left an orphan while still a child, he was put to work as soon as he was big enough to be of any use, and received practically no education, although he managed to teach himself to read and write. He earned a few pennies by watering horses for travelers, and with this money purchased a spelling book and arithmetic. He served through the French War and the Revolution, rendering distinguished service and retiring with the rank of Brigadier General, and at its close, finding that Congress would be unable for a long time to pay many of the soldiers for their services, he became interested in the suggestion that payment be made in land along the Ohio River and offered to lead a band of settlers to their new homes. In March 1786, in Boston, he and some others formed the Ohio Company, and one of their directors, Manasseh Cutler, a preacher of more than usual ability, was selected to lay the company's plan before Congress. The result was the famous Ordinance of 1787, providing for the establishment and government of the Northwest Territory, of which Arthur St. Clair was named governor. Cutler also secured a large land grant for the new company, and in the following year, Putnam started across the mountains with the first band of immigrants. They reached the vicinity of Pittsburgh after a weary journey, and there built a boat which they named the Mayflower, and in it floated down the river, until they reached the mouth of the Muskingum. On April 17, 1788, they began the erection of a blockhouse, which was to be the nucleus of the new settlement, and a place of defense in case of Indian attack. The settlement was named Marietta, in honor of Marie Antoinette, the Queen of France. It prospered from the first, and in a few years was a lively little village. There were Indian alarms at first, but General Wayne's victory secured a lasting peace. Putnam served as a brigadier general in Wayne's campaign, and was one of the commissioners who negotiated the peace treaty. He lived for many years thereafter, and remained to the last the leading man of the settlement. He was interested in every project for the betterment of the new commonwealth, helped to found the Ohio University at Athens, was one of the drafters of the state constitution, and founded the first Bible school west of the mountains. A venerable figure, he died in 1824, having lived to see the valley which he had entered, a wilderness, settled by hundreds of thousands, and the state which he had helped to found become one of the greatest in the Union. By the end of the 18th century, the country between the Alleghanies and the Mississippi was fairly well known, first through the explorations of such pioneers as Boone and Clark and Kenton, and later on through the steady advance of civilization, forever throwing new outposts westward. But beyond the great river stretched a mighty wilderness whose character and extent were only guessed at. The United States, of course, had little interest in it, since it belonged to France, and since, east of the river, there were millions of acres as yet unsettled. But when, in 1803, President Jefferson purchased it of Napoleon Bonaparte for the sum of $15 million, all that was changed. 
By that purchase, the area of the United States was more than doubled, and there were many people at the time who opposed the purchase on the ground that the country east of the river would never be thoroughly settled, and that there would be no use whatever for the great territory west of it. So mistaken, sometimes, is human foresight. The President determined that this great addition to the nation should be explored without delay, and, securing from Congress the necessary powers, he appointed his private secretary, Captain Meriwether Lewis, to head an expedition to the Pacific. Lewis was, at that time, twenty-nine years of age. He seems to have been of an adventurous disposition, for, despite the fact that he inherited a fortune, he enlisted in the army as a private as soon as he was of age. Five years later, he had risen to the rank of captain, and, attracting the attention of President Jefferson, he was appointed his secretary. He proved to be so capable and enterprising that the President selected him for this dangerous and arduous task of exploration. With him was associated Lieutenant William Clark, a brother of that hardy adventurer, George Rogers Clark. William Clark, who was eighteen years younger than his famous brother, had joined him in Kentucky in 1784 at the age of fourteen, and soon became acquainted with the perils of Indian warfare. He was appointed ensign in the army four years later, and rose to the rank of adjutant, but was compelled to resign from the service in 1796 on account of ill health. He settled at the half-Spanish town of St. Louis and in march eighteen o four was appointed by president jefferson a second lieutenant of artillery with orders to join captain lewis in his journey to the pacific clark was really the military director of the expedition and his knowledge of indian life and character had much to do with his success the party consisted of twenty eight men and in the spring of eighteen o four started up the missouri following it until late in october when they camped for the winter near the present site of Bismarck, North Dakota. They resumed the journey early in the spring, and in May caught their first glimpse of the Rocky Mountains. Reaching the headwaters of the Columbia, at last, they floated down its current, and on the morning of November 7, 1806, after a journey of a year and a half, full of every sort of hardship and adventure, they saw ahead of them the blue expanse of the Pacific. They spent the winter on the coast, and reached St. Louis again in September 1807, having traversed over 9,000 miles of unbroken wilderness where no white man had ever before set foot. It was largely because of this expedition that our government was able, 40 years later, to claim and maintain a title to the state of Oregon. Congress rewarded the members of the expedition with grants of land, and Lewis was appointed governor of Missouri but the strain of the expedition to the pacific had undermined his health he became subject to fits of depression and on october eighth eighteen o nine he put an end to his life in a lonely cabin near nashville tennessee where he had stopped for a night's lodging clark lived thirty years longer serving as indian agent governor of missouri and superintendent of indian affairs while Lewis and Clark were struggling across the continent, another young adventurer was conducting some explorations farther to the east. Zebulon Pike, aged 27, a captain in the regular army, was, in 1805, appointed to lead an expedition to the source of the Mississippi. He accomplished this after a hard journey lasting nine months, and a year later, leading another expedition to the southwest, discovered a great mountain which he named Pike's Peak, and, continuing southward, came out on the Rio Grande. He was in Spanish territory, and was held prisoner for a time, but was finally released upon representations from the government at Washington. He rose steadily in the service, and in 1813, during the Second War with England, led an assault upon Little York, now Toronto. The town was captured, but the fleeing British exploded a powder magazine, and General Pike was crushed and killed beneath the flying fragments. He died with his head on the British flag, which had been hauled down and brought to him. The next step to be recorded in the growth of the United States is a step variously regarded as infamous or glorious, but it was marked by one of the most heroic incidents in history and dominated by the picturesque and remarkable personality of Sam Houston. The purchase of Louisiana from the French brought the United States in direct contact with Mexico, which claimed a great territory in the southwest, and finally, in 1819, a line between the possessions of the two countries was agreed upon. It left Mexico in possession of the wide stretch of country now included in the states of California, Nevada, 
utah colorado arizona new mexico oklahoma and texas most of this country was practically unknown to americans and the great stretches of arid land which comprised large portions of it were considered worthless and uninhabitable but a good many americans had drifted across the border into the fertile plains of texas and settled there as time went on the stream of immigration increased until there were in the country enough american settlers to take a prominent part in the revolt of mexico against spain in eighteen twenty four the revolt was successful and the country which had discovered the new world lost her last foothold there the settlers in texas coming as they did largely from the southern states were naturally slaveholders but in eighteen twenty nine mexico abolished slavery an action which greatly enraged them it is startling to reflect that a country which we consider so inferior to ourselves should have preceded us by over thirty years in this great step forward in civilization in other ways, the Mexican yoke was not a pleasant one to the Texans, and within a few years, the whole country was in a state of seething insurrection. President Jackson was eager to annex Texas, whose value to the Union he fully recognized, and offered Mexico five million dollars for the province, but the offer was refused. Such was the condition of affairs when, in 1833, Sam Houston appeared upon the scene. End of Pioneers, Part 2 Recording by William Tomko